Today's guest is Leila Silverday. We met in Bali, Leila and I, actually about four years ago, four plus years ago, just before all of the craziness through a mutual friend. And then all of a sudden we were going to Dubai to the same event. We both went to the Dr. Joe Dispenza advanced retreat. I remember it very clearly that that retreat because my parents were there and Leila and I connected deeply at that event. I absolutely adore her work. Leila does everything heart math and heartfulness. She is a leading heartfulness therapist and expert in heart brain coherence, in resolving uh, inner child things, in helping. She works with like some of the wealthiest people in the world, royalty, billionaires, and she helps them with whatever issues. So actually right at the end of the episode, I ask her, what are some of these issues that these millionaires, billionaires, royalty have? And her her answer is really, really fascinating. Leila in this episode shares her story of being bullied and why these days and and her bullying is intense she's got a chipped tooth still from from that which is wild she goes on to say you know why she doesn't mind ruffling feathers and why she actually likes it she shares what's better than plant medicine plant medicine is all the hype these days and uh, what's better and cheaper than plant medicine. So stay tuned for all these goodies. Stay connected, stay curious. Send me your comments. Let me know what you think, what questions you have. I will be there to answer them. Enjoy this episode. Leila, so amazing to have you here. It's been a while since we've connected in person, but I know we had like such a great time. We were in Dubai actually last time at a Dr. Joe Dispenza event, uh, yeah. meditating for 10 hours a day for seven days a week type of thing. And that's where we were like really connected. So yeah, it's really, really great to reconnect with you here. I would love to kind of go back to the source, to the beginning of things. And what kind of themes from your childhood dictated or have transpired into what you do as an adult or how you are as a human being these days? It's a deep, broad question. So Mm -hmm. I would say some of the main codes that follow through into building my operating system would definitely be growing up in a multicultural home where I heard six Mm. languages at the same time, everything from Arabic to Swiss German. And yeah, my mother was born in Egypt, grew up in Lebanon, but she's half American, half Lebanese. My my father's Swiss, but he grew, grew up between Colombia and Venezuela. So it wasn't unusual for me to hear six languages in one given day. My mom and my father would be on a phone call and they'd be flipping between three different languages at a time. So that is definitely a core code that has carried through of just the deeper in intuitive knowing that we are all connected, we are all interwoven, right? That just was such a foundational knowing from a young age, the the different cultures, the different languages that inform all of us, especially now in, in the world that we are living in with internet, right? Um, and then also, so just that unity consciousness, I think is, is a core code. Another one would be certainly, I was hyper intuitive as a child. Many children are, and then we get knocked out of it through the school system, the modern school system. But that certainly was very true for me. I was a hyper-intuitive person. I was actually more fundamentally operating from the intelligence of my heart, from my heart brain. And that lead or led to me. So what, what that means is I grew up in Switzerland in a small town in the forest. I was what my sixth sense, which is the heart intelligence was wide open. And so it wasn't unusual for me to sense those other things beyond the 3D and just interact with that, right? 
So I always say that the forest and the trees are what built my intuition because I would get lost in the forest. I mean, I, I remember being five years old and just going as far and as deep. I'm a little bit of a crazy person. I just, I always want to challenge myself and I'm very curious. So I would just, you know, go one mile further or one kilometer further that day into the forest. And, and then somehow, and this is the power of the field, right? When we connect and connect to it through the power of our heart, I somehow always found my way home. And that was me really building the, the, the intelligence of my heart, the power of my heart, because the heart is also a a muscle as well as a brain and an organ. And, and mm -hmm. so I would say that certainly as well, really just being connected with nature, with the elemental wisdom, with the sixth sense and all that is included within that. Um, mm -hmm. And I would say another one to, to kind of create a Trinity here is certainly <laughs> the difference in let's say being different and how, when you live, you know, it was such a stark contrast for me because I was very, let's say unique compared to the average person that lived in this small Swiss town that I grew up in. And I was there from six years old to 12 years old and the bullying that took place and the wrong making, not only from my schoolmates, but also my teachers was hardcore. Um, we're talking emotional, physical, and mental, like bullying, right? Um, I even have half a tooth missing because of <laughs> that time in my life. It was, it was pretty yeah. intense. But that, that kind of experience, right, of later on being able to recognize after going through, you know, trauma healing and inner child healing and all the healings that are necessary when you, when you kind of grow up in that kind of an environment, um, outside of your home, it's or outside of my home. Um, it really helped me understand what happens when people solely operate from the mind and the mm. contraction and the separation that takes place from that operating system. And that definitely is also a follow through. And, and ultimately, you know, for ex just to give an example, I, I was a visual, I am a visual learner. And so in first or second grade, I, you know, we were learning how to count. So I was like, okay, one plus one, oh, it's two, right? And the teacher came and just slapped me across the wrist with the ruler and said, that's, you know, if you have to count with your hands, you're stupid. Don't do that. Count in your head. And then I would go on and develop dyscalculi, which is dyslexia with numbers. But I also am dyslexic because the Swiss school system was just gnarly, pulled a really intense one on me. And, um, and so I just started seeing everything backwards and upside down and around. Um, so even that, right, being able to go back to that realization of, okay, I'm Diff there's so many different learning styles. There's so many different operating systems, none of which is better than the other. They are all perfect. But if we force a child to learn in a way that is not intuitive to them, we're going to cause a lot of damage. And if that individual doesn't have enough support or um, awareness to heal that damage, you know, they live with that for the rest of their lives. And thankfully I had the support and the means and the awareness to recognize that, you know, I can go back and heal that and, and recenter and recognize that I am not stupid <laughs> because that was yeah. a core belief that was really, um, pounded in for many years. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm curious about some of the words that you use or your choice of words from codes to operating systems for anyone who's newer to these ty this types of this type of language where where does it come from for you like where where did you first come into an understanding that things do operate in codes and operating systems i think it's it was an amalgamation of many different 
pieces coming together and then just me doing my own research and writing my own programs and in the process of writing my own book as well, where I just developed this language. But um, I truly fundamentally believe that we as human beings are the most intelligent design and or if you want to get a little edgy device ever designed, right? Mm -hmm. This, this thing called the human body, it is so meticulously perfectly designed. It's, it's magical. <laughs> There's no mm -hmm. other way that can really fully describe this incredible thing, right? Called the human being. And every little piece of it that it is required in order to operate at our full potential, right? And I have um, one of the original vision videos for my first company, Standing Light. Um, it's it's on YouTube. You can go check it out at the Standing Light YouTube channel. And I and I share this code that your heart is your core processor, your head is your heart drive. Your body is the motherboard and your spirit is the power cord. And so. Mm. That's a us, beautiful visual. Can, can you just repeat that again? Your, your heart is the. Your heart is your core processor. Core your, processor. Mind, mm -hmm. your mind, your head is the hard drive. Mm -hmm. Your body is the motherboard and your spirit is the power cord. Wow. I love that. That's beautiful. Yeah, because I resonate with it on a very profound level to the degree that I don't know if there is, I don't really believe in man versus machine. I almost mm -hmm. see it as a spectrum of mm -hmm. biology and then the technology and that nature is technology. Mm -hmm. And I had all of these downloads a few a few years ago and even like you say like you grew up with six different languages i have a, a tattoo that re represents the first three languages that i was coded in which mm -hmm. was uh, you know russian from the ussr ukrainian english so i love how you you explain all of that and the thing i wanted to ask was about the heart brain for anyone who's completely new to what that means and has never heard of the heart brain before can you share a little bit more about that Absolutely. So heart intelligence is a very real thing. This is not something that's made up. And just to um, share one of the biggest institutions that's been studying the science of the heart is called Heart Math. They're based in Boulder Creek, California, so Northern California. Uh, that's where I did a lot of my studying on the power and the science of the heart. I then took it much deeper and I studied with Drunvela Melchizedek's predecessor, Daniel Mitel and so on and forth, so forth, just went very deep into the more spiritual science of the heart, let's call it, which also is very much connected with quantum physics. And so mm. backing up to your last question, you know, where I got this kind of language from, I would say it's also very much informed through quantum physics, mm -hmm. but heart intelligence, I'll just give the heart intelligence 101. So every single yeah. human heart is made up of 40,000 neurons. These are sensory neurites, which function independently from the head brain. And these 40,000 neurons called the, the heart brain send more information to the head brain than the head brain to the heart brain. And then let's go a little bit deeper than that, right? Now we're going to go to the moment we started being built, right? We started forming in our mother's womb. And the first organ that's ever created is the heart. And that's how scientists realized that the heart has its own functioning brain, because before the head brain is ever developed in uterus, the heart organ begins to pump, begins to beat. And that's how they realized and recognized that the heart has its own brain because it knows to start beating and pumping before any other brain is ever developed. So then take it even further back and let's just drop into the beautiful, magical synchronicity of soul light igniting in 
the womb and that being who we are, who you are, you are your soul. And then your heart forming around that soul, that light, who you are, that you are, and then everything else forms, right? But that is the creation story that I feel is not spoken about. And we have become so soul disconnected. <laughs> and when we reconnect consciously with our heart and soul, because in many ancient traditions, Vedic, Vedic traditions, they actually talk about the heart being the first chakra. And now when you understand the bio, biological process, right, that makes sense. Of course, the heart would be the first chakra. And if you don't know what chakras are, those are energy points in the human body. Um, the most famous ones are, are seven of them, right? And the center of those seven chakras is the heart, right? So the heart is not only an organ, not only a muscle, not only a brain, it's all three of those. And the intelligence of the heart is intuition. And so when we want to break it down into what I like to talk about in my workshops and courses, the human intel, we have three brains, first being the heart, the intelligence of which is intuition, second, the gut brain, the intelligence of which is instinct, and then third being the head brain, the intelligence of which is logic. But as human beings, we have only programmed and created systems, especially school systems, educational systems around only educating and informing the head brain, which has caused this huge disconnect from our soul, sixth sense, our body instinct. And of course, there's going to be dis-ease <laughs> because we are fundamentally disconnected to two very powerful brains, but especially one, because the heart is the most powerful brain on a magnetic and energetic level in the human body. And I would even go as far as saying it is the most intelligent one as well. Wow. Yeah. I also have find that like in society, the thing that's valued is the head brain, right? Mm -hmm. Like everything else, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, but the more I have like lent into my heart, the more, like you say, magic opens up. And I really love the quote that like technology is indistinguishable or magic is indistinguishable from advanced enough technology, mm -hmm. you know? So when it comes to that, like intelligence and the magic that can be unlocked from the heart is just, mm -hmm. it's, it's fascinating. If someone is looking to sharpen their intuition or has recognized that maybe they are disconnected, what are some steps that they can take to connect or to start listening to their intuition more? So I'm going to ask you and your audience a question first. How many times a day do you make the choice to listen to the voice in your head over the voice in your heart? That's a hard one because how do you know? Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference, no? So how, what is the first step to really like differentiating the two soundtracks that could be going on type of thing? Good, good uh, wording. So, I mean, it's, it's an open question, right? Because just yeah. in that question alone, that's, that's one of the steps that I ask my clients because most you, you have done a lot of inner work, right? So you might think about this in a whole deeper way, right? Whereas the average person will immediately say, well, all, I mean, obviously I'm going to listen to my head over my heart, Right. I mean, you just even just look into our culture, you know, in, in movies or whatnot, and, and they're constantly programming us to just, you know, the heart is weak and silly and emotional as if that's a bad thing. So don't trust your heart, trust your head, right? So even just the subliminal programming that has been programmed into us through our media alone has to first be deprogrammed or reprogrammed. And so that's just a question that I 
invite you, the listener, to ask yourself in any given moment when you are faced with a micro or macro decision, take a moment, that conscious moment between making the decision, which happens in milliseconds, right? But before you actually make that final decision and you make the action towards whatever that decision may be, take a moment to take a breath, bring your hand to your heart even, actually connect with the beat of your heart, feel it, and really take a conscious moment to feel the beat of your heart. Close your eyes. Connect with the beat of your heart. Connect with the conscious intelligence of your heart. The same as you would connect with your head brain, right? And ask it questions and think it's so intelligent and try to think through your head. This is an invitation to feel through your heart and with your heart. And when you do that, that starts to build a whole new relationship. And that starts to sever the disconnection. Sorry, the reconnect, right? The severance. Is that correct? I've been living in Switzerland too long. My English is <laughs> getting all wacky. But you know what I'm saying? And Reprogram and that relationship. Yeah. Um, exactly. And and really build the relationship, right? So what I tell my clients, whether it's at the clinic or in my private practice, it's first step, just bring your hand to your heart and hear the beat and start to build, rebuild that relationship. Start to recognize how intelligent it actually is, which re requires a reprogramming. And that's the first step because that alone will take a little bit. I can definitely attest to situations where I knew deep down that I'd need to leave a business, for example, right? But logically, there would be all of these reasons why I couldn't, whether it was like my reputation or financial, or I'd disappoint someone, or what about my clients? What about this? And all these things. And inevitably the heart always like it's going to win right you're going to make that decision inevitably well the same thing happens you know when deep down you kind of feel like you need to leave a relationship for example right or whatever major decision you need to make and like we get so stuck in those cycles of thinking and trying to think through things and disregarding uh the way way of the heart so I guess, like, what is the biggest way to trust your heart more besides, you know, connecting with it, uh, but like to really build that relationship and that trust, like what are some, some things that can be done? I know it, it sounds simple, but it is so profound because it really is a matter of if you spent five minutes a day right after waking up and, you know, go to the restroom, sit down on your meditation pillow, or even just stay in your bed and place your hand on your heart and just sit with your heart and meditate with and through your heart. It's, mm -hmm. you could also call it inner child work, but it's really just that repair work that is so necessary because we have lost touch with that inner voice, which I have come to find and believe is the soul. And if you want to go into the more technological terminology again, our soul, your soul is the original AI. It is ancient intelligence. And so mm. until you start to actually reconnect with your heart, which is the home of your soul, right? You're just going to be thinking forward, acting forward without ever truly doing that inner work and feeling inward because the heart is the human compass. And just to also explain, the heart emits an electromagnetic field that is 5,000 times more powerful magnetically and infinite amount of times more powerful energetically. And then to add to that, our Earth, our planet Mother Earth, she emits an electromagnetic field from her core, 
from her most inner core, right? There's many different layers. And then there's that inner most circle and core, right? From that, let's say, heart of Mother Earth, an electromagnetic field emits as well. And the sun also emits an electromagnetic field. Most planets in our solar system emit an electromagnetic field. The ones that don't are weaker, they're weaker. But we as human beings are fundamentally connected core to core with ourselves, with one another, with our celestial bodies, including Mother Earth, right? So Mm -hmm. when we start to do that, inner work, because everybody keeps talking about do the inner work, do the inner work. Well, what does that mean? Right? I mean, people will be like, I don't know where to start. Start where it all began. Start with your heart. And the moment you start to actually take that seriously, I mean, you were, before we got on the podcast, right? You were talking about plant medicine. I love how so many people are obsessing over this, whatever it may be. Ayahuasca is like the hot topic right now, right? Mm -hmm. Let's just break that down. How much money are you investing in that? How much time are you investing in that? Because you're taking time. Usually if you do it, you know, full fledged way, you're, you're researching who's the best shaman, what's the best place to do it at, right? That's a lot of time and energy. Then you do a dieta before you go. Then you go, then you're there. Maybe what? I don't know, a few days, a week, two weeks. Then you need some integration decompression time, right? all the while you've invested a lot of money and time and energy in it, right? What if you actually just took all of that energy and time in simply coming home to who you truly are and rebuilding that relationship? I promise you, I have had, let's say, crazier trips and experiences merely doing that, merely sitting with my heart than I've ever had on any kind of plant medicine psychedelic because the deeper you go the deeper you will feel and it will open up dimensions that you can not even logically comprehend but before you feel safe enough for that to happen and not have to use something outside of yourself to break through into that right but just gently let your body naturally adapt into that next higher version of yourself, more expansive version of yourself, where you get to then download higher operating systems. It just requires time and and care to just rebuild that relationship with your heart and soul. Yeah. Just like you said at the beginning that children have this innate ability and then we cover it up and we're unplugged from from the source, you know, in a sense. Mm -hmm. So going back to your story a little bit, because I know you came for, you had a time that you were in fashion and I'm not sure what other things you did. How, like, take me through that a little bit and how did you have this like pivot to heart intelligence, to heart math and to what you're doing today? How did your path and your life guide you? It's a very long story, but I'll break it down. <laughs> and yeah, my- we're here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I. My first career was in fashion. I I moved from Arizona to London, England, to study at Central Saint Martin's Fashion Textile Design, and I I actually my thesis, my focus was in sustainable fashion. This is back in the day when. I would say sustainable fashion. Oh, I'm, you know, studying sustainable fashion and people were like, what is that? So Mm. that's, that's how far back it went. And, um, and it was incredible. Um, So from the beginning, you know, I look back at my kind of path and pattern and I was always trying to find the source of the greatest disconnect on this planet for this humanity to try to, reconnect or heal. Right. And I think that certainly was my fundamental kind of inner fire always guiding me. Um, and what happened was, um, being in London, I mean, I was, I was, I was, I had a really incredible career going. I was the youngest backstage manager at the London fashion week. I got, I had gotten a job proposal at Stella McCartney, who was like my absolute idol. And then in a very short amount of time, everything that could have 
broken down, broke down um, in my personal life, in every, and then that affected everything else. And that then activated my first dark night of the soul. And there's a longer story around this, but ultimately I <laughs> decided to move from London to Los Angeles. And I was in LA by myself because, um, just to not confuse people, we had moved when I was 12 years old from Switzerland to Scottsdale, Arizona, which is where I adopted this American accent. And, mm -hmm. and then I did middle school and high school in, in Arizona, hated it, moved to England for university because Central St. Martin's, it's the Harvard of fashion. It was always my dream. Um, and in the time that I was in England, my parents moved back to Switzerland. So me moving from London to LA, you know, I was going again, very far away from my family and everything that I knew. And I started just healing and rebuilding myself in the arms of the angels. I like to say in the city of angels. And it was there where I, you know, I, I lived across the first Irwan and uh, some people will know what that is. Some people won't, but it's basically like the ultimate health Mecca grocery store. <laughs> and super bougie. <laughs> well, now, Extra bougie. Now it is. Yes. It, it franchised. It, it expanded like crazy. But back then it was not bougie at all. It was the, oh, tiniest, interesting. It was the tiniest little thing. Yes. The magical healing tonic drinks were very expensive. I will attest to that, but it was because the ingredients that they were putting in there were so next level. I mean, we're talking back then. I mean, this is 2010. I mean, reishi, ashwagandha, cordyceps, all this stuff that now people know much more about. And there's many ways, many more ways to source it. But back then, you know, it was, it was a very special um, item. So, and they were putting much more of those ingredients in the tonics. Now they've, they basically let go of the original tonic wisdom keepers and they mm. put in much less of the ingredients. So you're still paying 15 bucks for a cup, but there's much less ingredients in it. Okay. Anyway. Um, so Interesting. yeah, nice sidebar, <laughs> but I didn't know all of that about R1. So that's very cool. Yeah. So you're back, you're in LA and uh, what happens, what happens there? I go through a health and wellness revolution. You know, I started really learning about health and wellness, self-development. I, I found myself doing Landmark, which back in the day was, you know, pretty revolutionary. Now it's not so much and definitely has a, you know, certain opinions about it. But I just, I started going really deep into that inner work, into the healing work, into the nutritional work. And in that time, I was going so deep and I was working with actually a, a shaman, a medicine woman, not doing medicine work per se in terms of like um, plant medicine, but really true medicine work. I mean, we, we had weekly calls, deep, deep dives, deep inner, inner child work, deep energetic work. It was, it was incredible. And so I was really doing the work, let's say. And in that time, I was, I started my meditation practice. So I was what, 22, 23 years old, doing all of this work with this shaman. And I remember the first, the second meditation, like conscious meditating I ever did. I don't know why, but I started channeling. And that's when my first company, Standing Light, literally just downloaded into my being. And it was like this out-of-body experience of God or a God-like voice telling me, Layla, do create this company called Standing Light. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I, and you're asking about like how I came into this heart journey or heart intelligence path, right? That was one key moment, but going back to 10th grade when I was 16, 15 years old, I was in chemistry class, and this is actually on my about page on standinglight.com, a little version of it. Um, I was sitting in chemistry class and the teacher was going over chemical compounds. I being the artist at heart, bored out of my mind, 
And I just start doodling on a piece of paper what potentially my chemical compound could be. I just felt inspired to ask myself, well, if there's all these chemical compounds, what's my chemical compound? And I just started doodling all these different signs and symbols on this piece of paper, which I think I still might have somewhere. And suddenly I see this heart. And what had happened was I was doodling the Aries symbol because I'm an Aries and I'm born on the 5th of April. So what ended up happening was the Aries is the top part of the heart, the Aries symbol. And then the Roman numeral five is the bottom part of the heart. So I actually got it mm-hmm. tattooed for those of you okay. that are just to Yeah. Uh-huh. And wow. it's, and I, as soon as I realized that I had, I really, that was my first out of body experience. I suddenly was in my astral body, looking down at my physical self, realizing that my birthday created the shape of a heart. And I, I asked spirit, what I now call spirit in that moment, what is going on? What is this? And I got an answer of Layla, you're not going to know what this means now, but when it's time you will. And so I got a fake ID, ran and tattooed that symbol on the left, on my left wrist. And the rest is history. So that was 10th grade, 16, 15 years old. Fast forward to then 22, 23, and getting that download of standing light, and then immediately connecting the logo needing to be that shape, right? My my chemical compound. And soon after, I would discover Greg Braden, heart math, mm-hmm. and go into that. So it was, Mm -hmm. it was just these, it was kind of like a scavenger hunt, (laughs) quite literally. Right. I just pieced it all together. And, and then once I was able to recognize the pieces, I wove it together and I, to this day, never wrote a business plan. It was always, and always will be a heart plan because I let the compass of my heart guide every move that I make now It was a little bit more difficult back in the day. I'm not going to lie. It takes some reprogramming. As I said, that's, that's how I came into this space. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. And how has this standing light way of life and this heart centric way of life, how has that impacted your relationships? How does it impact the way you relate with people in your life? It's, it's the fundamental operating system of how I relate and how, how we as humans relate, right? This isn't, it's not just a standing light method thing. It's, it's a heart thing. And when you understand how the heart operates and its power, what I haven't shared yet is that every thought and emotion goes from your heart into this electromagnetic field. And if you've never seen an electromagnetic field, I invite you to Google it and either type human electromagnetic field and or human Taurus field, because Taurus field Mm -hmm. is, is pretty much the same. And you'll understand what I'm saying, because it really is this, it looks like a web of life, right? That emits from the heart all around you. And every one of those lines that forms the web is informed by your thoughts and emotions. And we call this field, the subtle field. And this is an electromagnetic field that is emitting out of you and back into you constantly. There is not one moment where it's not, unless you are done with this life and you're going on to the next, right? Um, And so just to understand that, we are constantly relating through and within this field with ourselves because it's what programs our reality. Imagine if every thought and emotion is going from your self, your heart, and informing the program of this so-called electromagnetic field, that is your reality, right? You are seeing the world through this field. This is your movie that is being played. And then that's what people are sensing and feeling and picking you up as is whatever you have emitted 
and are emitting whatever you've emitted into this field and what's emitting out of that field. As human beings or in relationships, right, we are sending more information through our hearts and through the fields than anything else. And that's when you you sense and you feel, right? For example, when somebody, you're in a room with a bunch of people and suddenly somebody walks in and they just have this, I mean, you don't even see that somebody is walking in, but you just feel or sense something and you can't explain it. And you turn your head and this incredible being is walking in and you're just like, what, what does that person do to just be that lit up? You know, it's, and, and that is the power of the, the sixth sense in a sense, right? Because you don't have eyes behind your head, but you sense these things and you clock it. So you could really, you know, call this, this, they, in ancient Egypt, they call the, the heart, the eye of the heart. They call it an eye Mm -hmm. because when you actually train it, you will start to pick up senses beyond your five senses. And so in relationships, in relating, right? When you understand or rather understand this very powerful technology that is our original communication channel, you start to operate in in a much different way, in a much more conscious way, because you recognize that anything that I am sensing and feeling and thinking on a subtle level, the person I am right next to is going to sense and feel. Their logical brain might not be able to process it, but on some level they are feeling it and they are gonna Mm -hmm. pick it up, vice versa, right? So that kind of, you know, sixth sense is is not a woo thing. This is a very real exchange that is happening constantly. And when you are in a relationship, whether it's a friendship or a lovership or whatever it may be, even with your family, right? Because mothers and, and parents have a very intrinsic connection with their children and they sense and feel. I mean, they've done studies even on this where a mother has a child at university on the other side of the world and she wakes up in the middle of the night calling her son saying, are you okay? Because she just was woken up by this ping. And sure enough, the son is having a total nervous breakdown and about to commit suicide. These are very real circumstances that have happened and that will continue to happen. And they happen through the field. It's, It's our original World Wide Web. It's our original communication channel, our satellites, our hearts are satellites for the people that we connect with on a feet on a on a vibrational level. It is it informs every part of my relationships, the one with myself and the one with everybody in my life, because it, it really brings you into this, into the realization of how responsible you get to be with your energy because it really does affect everything, including most importantly yourself, right? So then the question is, what kind of energy do you want to feed yourself with on a daily basis? Do you want to feed yourself with the lower vibrational energies, such as shame, fear, judgment, and just keep that on a loop, which most humans, (laughs) that's their fuel. That is the energy that they choose to operate through and by. Or do you want to, Mm -hmm. you know, break the matrix and use those higher vibrational energies and or emotions such as appreciation, gratitude, love, trust, and let that fuel you, right? Because when you're letting that fuel you, and it's not to say that the lower vibrations are bad and they're not good to process. We need to process them. But what do you want your core fundamental um operating system to be operated by, right? And that for me is love. And when I made that shift from fear to love, my whole life changed. Everything started to change. What I like about what you said there is that despite us thinking that we can hide things from people, I don't think we can hide all that much. And it doesn't have to be specifics or nuances of but you can like very definitely tell the level of vibration, whether 
it's heavy or light and I think a lot of people lie to themselves and others about how much they think they can c conceal things and when we are tuned in to the field there's not much that gets away from us I do see like I appreciate relationships where people can understand and see that you know I have some friends who tell me Leila they'll be like I don't want to hang out with you because you're going to see the whole me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay, fair enough. You know, like that's transparency <laughs> as well. <laughs> but people are afraid mm -hmm. of that kind of power, right? Of that kind of intimacy into you, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just, it's so new. I think mm -hmm. that like the big, a big part of the world is still living in the dark a little bit and thinking they can conceal and hide things. Whereas mm -hmm. the more we come into this light and understanding of this field, um, the more responsibility we have to take to be better as well, you know, and that takes work. And most people would rather scroll and read a million different quotes than sit with their heart for five minutes. And on that note of like plant medicine, one of the big messages I got in my recent ceremony was just like integration. Like you just have to integrate everything and not just integration from like the ceremony perspective, but everything that you're consuming, you know, like if you read a book, integrate it. If you learn a method, integrate it versus like find the next fix and the next potential method, whatever. I was curious with the way you see things and unity being one of the predominant codes, what happens when two people have severely opposite perspectives on something? I'll give you a practical example. So uh, my grandma is very into her Russian propaganda because she lives in Crimea. My dad is super pro-Ukraine. And this is just in my family that I can, I can see, right? And they have this really hard time between this like pro-Russia, pro-Ukraine um, perspectives. And it's painful for them, you know, to, to sit with that and go through that. So what, what happens like in your view when, when, when that kind of like headbutting occurs and where it's, feels impossible to see the other person's perspective or this unity consciousness to exist um how do you how do you go about how do you go about that <laughs> you're asking me to solve the uh, world peace right now but um <laughs> i know <laughs> why not <laughs> okay. i i believe anything is possible so <laughs> let's go <laughs> Um, I'll just turn my, my opinion on, on just, I mean, just the example that you gave, right? That's a very standard way of operating because both your grandmother and your father are operating from the mind solely, right? They are stuck in one belief, which comes from the head and it's based on fear because if they took a moment and really came into their hearts, they would recognize that at the core of both of them, what they want is peace, is love, is safety, is togetherness, is unity, right? And so that's shifting from the dualistic operating system of the mind, because by nature, the head brain is two hemispheres. So it's constantly going to operate in duality, which is necessary. It's not a bad thing. We need logic, right? If we just were these yeah. power puff heart beings, you know, just care bears that just constantly were shooting rainbows out of our hearts. I mean, I think that that's heaven, but we're here to learn some major lessons and that wouldn't really you know, serve a purpose. So we need logic. We need the intellect. We need this brain that will kind of jump back and forth and say, is this good? Is this bad? Is this wrong? Is this right? Is this black? Is this right? Right. It, we need that brain to assess things, to judge things. But if we only let that be the, the controlling factor, we're, we're stay we're choosing to stay in separation and disconnection because the heart operates from unity consciousness. 
it truly does, right? That's its mm-hmm. power. That's its force. That's in- its intelligence. It understands, it understands, it feels and senses through wisdom what is at the core of somebody else's desires, wants, and needs. And when somebody is saying something, right, the mind will pick up their words, but the heart will feel what they're actually trying to communicate, right? So I, that's why I, I am doing the work that I'm doing and I'm building the second company that I'm building because we need to scale these teachings. We need to help train human beings, humanity to learn how to operate with the heart as well as the head, but in a coherent manner so that we're not stuck in this con- continuous separating dualistic program. Mm. And like you said, it, it really like that vision of by design, the brain has two hemispheres. There's a couple of times you use the word inner standing in place of understanding. Now, can you share a little bit about what the difference is between inner standing and understanding? I, I can't take uh, credit for that term because a dear sister of mine shared it with me. I don't know if she made it up but or came up with it, but I find you know, words are spells. We are literally spelling our reality with every word that we say. Um, So even just, there was something that you shared earlier where you said we have to do this, right? But when we go into us, into the languaging of we get to do this, you know, we get to take Mm -hmm. responsibility over ourselves and our planet and our human family. That is, Mm -hmm. that is not something we have to do. Yes, we do have to do it if we want a better world, right? But we get to do that. And when we come from that place, it, it changes the whole feeling of it, right? It's an invitation. It's it's a gift. Um, but understanding versus understanding, just feel into this, the difference, right? Like, do you want to have to stand under something in order to connect with it and and recognize it, which kind of makes you, you know, inferior and smaller because Mm -hmm. whatever your understanding is bigger than you and you're not worthy enough to, you know, be with it or next to it versus when you're truly understanding something, it's embodied. You, you just get it. It's fully downloaded and integrated in to you. Wow. I love that so much. Thank you for sharing. I mean, I haven't heard that before, but I will be using it now uh, because I really do agree that spell, you know, words are spells and the words that we use are incredibly, incredibly important. I'm curious when you work with clients and because there's a spectrum of people who are connected to their hearts versus not connected to their hearts. And you'll get like, I've had, you know, with some clients and some of them have been men, let's just say that, where, who are like in business, entrepreneurship, super logical. That's how they got to where they, they, want, they, they got and they value it so much. So it is more difficult to access the heart and to listen to the heart. When you do have a client who's struggling extra to, to get there, like what, um, I guess like, is it just time and patience and practice, especially if someone's really like stuck with like, oh, I, I, it's it, like the, the way I operate is so much in my brain that like I can't even imagine operating from my heart. Like for someone who's in that kind of scenario, what, what do they do? What, what could they do? That's, pr- it's normal, right? Especially for men. Um, the programming, mm-hmm. imagine, I mean, put yourself in, in their shoes for men. Most men have been told most of their lives that if they cry, they're weak. If they, you know, feel anything or connect with that part of themselves, let's call it the inner feminine, right? Because every single human being has both feminine and masculine within them, right? And we're now in an era where slowly but surely as a collective, we're starting to recognize that and honor that and start to do that, um, that inner work where we're really balancing the inner feminine and masculine man and Mm -hmm. woman. Right. So I think that's one thing, especially to, to really, um, to address. Um, it's funny because 
I, so I, I have my private practice coaching practice, right. But then I also, I am I'm a heartfulness therapist at the world's most exclusive clinic, which services ultra high net worth individuals, billionaires, royalties, you name it. And most of them are men. So um. my, my approach is meet them where they're at, right? Like I used to back in the day when I was a little bit more, uh, fresh in the game, let's say I felt this fire of just, or this, this thing would take over me. I, I just wanted to blast somebody with my light and just heal them and, and just saying it, right. I mean, that's such an ego driven thing, <laughs> but when we really come from that more humble, heartful place and recognize every single human being is where they're, where they're at. And if we can meet them where they're at, we get to help them grow in a much more coherent, natural, comfortable way. And, mm. and, and that's where true guidance and true coaching, I feel like is, is, um, happens, right? When you, when you meet that person where they're at, not making them wrong for being too head brainy or too feely or, you know, too much or not enough or, you know, I mean, those are big traumas in humans being too much or not enough. And many of us have both, right. Of those traumas. So as men, I think, you know, I'm just going to blanket statement this. Most of them mm -hmm. feel like, especially now with the whole me too movement, which has, in my opinion, gone way out of hand. And there's so much of the like angry, dark feminine that's just been casting out all over the place. You know, you, you turn on Instagram and, and there's all these actually masculine women, you know, with like nails out to here, reprimanding men and saying they're not men enough. They're not powerful enough. And it's just like, do you really think that that's actually going to help the divine masculine feel safe? You know, because the dark feminine is also toxic and there's a lot mm -hmm. of that happening right now. So I think if, especially as a woman, really embodying ourselves in that loving, fierce, also protective feminine, right? If, if we're in, in the coaching domain, right? Using that to, to invite a man back into his heart. And for, for me, when I work with men that are very heady, very brainy, I don't start at the heart. I start at the head and I have, you know, my, the heart math tools where they can literally see their heart rate variability and they start to see when they're coming into coherence versus when they're not in a coherent state. And, and that's what I'm saying. Like I'm meeting them where they're at, because if, if they're not ready to go into the heart, it's me just trying to tell them about it and shame them for it or whatever is not going to help. Right. Right. I have to meet them where they're at. And so I show them the science because the head loves science. It loves things that are proven, right? And we start there gently, slowly. And then slowly, once the brain trusts what's going on, it will then let go slowly and start to kind of give way to accessing the heart. Mm, beautiful. And what type of things, I'm just curious, these billionaires and royalty and all sorts of quote unquote successful people, uh, what type of things are they working through? I know you can't go into details, but like, what, are, what do you think are the maladies that they're looking to solve when they do come to a facility like the one you work at? You know, that's what's been so fascinating is that <laughs> recognizing that Every single person that I have gotten to work with, it all comes down to the same thing. They're just, and, and they wouldn't put it in these words. They wouldn't, you know, describe it like this. But ultimately, all any one of us wants is to feel connected and safe within again, to have that inner love, that self love. And so, whether it's a client that, I mean, I, I'm, I'm working with everything from like any addiction you can imagine to schizophrenia or to just basic, you know, health and wellness top-ups in a sense, you know, just, so there's the whole spectrum that I 
um, yeah, that I work with at the clinic specifically, but whatever traumas they have, which are plenty, and we, you know, you don't have to go to a clinic or be somebody famous or powerful to have trauma. Um, it, it's all, we all are desperately desiring to be connected to this source of love, but that happens from within. And that can only mm. truly be healed when we choose to reconnect to the source of love from and with our hearts. Mm. What is your definition of self-love? No one's ever asked me that. That's beautiful. My intuitive answer is self-love is being so surrendered in trust and knowing that whatever you do feel or experience is happening for your highest good and that you get to trust yourself in whatever is happening because you can handle it. And even if you can't, it's going to be a beautiful lesson that will grow you into your next highest path and version. Hmm. Beautiful. I'm curious because sometimes when we have like an inner voice or it sounds like an intuition, it can be based on fear and like more of an instinct to protect ourselves or to go back to our comfort zone or whatnot. If someone's like newer to understanding, oh, is this a, a fear-based direction or voice or is this my intuition that's expansion-based? Like how would someone go about uh, discerning between the two? It's a great question. So you can actually viscerally feel the two experiences in your body. And so mm -hmm. what I say is when you're make, you know, going through that decision-making process, again, like connect, come into your body and you don't have to put your hand on your heart, just sit with yourself. And take a few deep breaths and really start to come into your body and, and get out of that chatter mind, right? And then when you're in that embodied conscious state of awareness, then feel into both of the decisions that you might be making, right? Should I do this or should I do that? And even if the one that your mind was scared of is because let's what tends to happen if if it's just a logical instinctual fear but it doesn't it it's not out of um, a true danger right like you're not it's not going to harm you if you do it let's say right it's just the ego trying to protect you from change because that's how it's wired mm -hmm. you will usually in your body when you feel into that let's say ego fear option your body will actually go into an easeful, much more calmer feeling. And if you have a sense of your electromagnetic field, or just imagine this bubble of light around you, it will actually expand. So if and when your body feels calm, at ease, and expanded, and even if that expandedness feels like excitement, that's that, right? That's the decision you get to go forward with. And then if the decision is contracting you and really, you know, making your heart go into a heightened state of uh, just fear, it's probably not for you, at least not in that moment. Okay, but letting so your heart really feel the difference, right? Yeah. And I guess a big part of that is like practicing feeling those two things so that you know what to look for. Because at the beginning, it'd be like, is this expansion? Is this contraction? I'm not, I don't quite know. And then like, as you practice it as a muscle going like, oh yes, I'm feeling more relaxed or I'm feeling more tense, like whatever it is. For that, um, yeah. the way to practice that, and we can do it really quickly. I know we're, we're um, almost out of time, but I recommend starting with literally just your name. So should we do that really quickly so somebody can take the time to actually practice this and feel into this now? Yeah, okay. I'd love that. Okay, so I invite you 
as long as you're not driving or operating any heavy machinery, <laughs> take a moment. Yeah, take if you moment. are, come back to this part. <laughs> yes. Stop here. Yeah. Back here. So just close your eyes. And if you want, bring your hand to your heart. And just connect. Feel the beat of your heart. And then I invite you now to say out loud your name. So for example, my name is Layla. And I want you to my say My name that. is Anna. And you say that, repeat that a few times out loud. And just mm -hmm. feel how your body, how your heart responds. Is there a deeper ease? Is there a little sparkle in your heart? Is there an expansion? I love to use the visualization of champagne bubbles, just like in your heart. Or is it just this neutral knowing certainty, like a a lightning strike of like, this is my name. However, it resonates for you. That is your yes. That is your truth. That is how your heart signals a yes to you, a truth to you. Do you have that, Anna? Do you feel it? Yeah, it feels really good. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. It's so now it's like when when I first said it, I was like like there was this like relief or just like grounding. Um beautiful or arriving almost. I don't know if I'm explaining it correctly. No, there's no wrong way. That's those are all beautiful, perfect words. Okay, so now we're going to experience the opposite, okay? So I invite you now to use a name that has absolutely no correlation to you and you say my name is and a false name and say it out loud three times and feel how your body and heart respond to that so if i just say my name is derek my name is derek my name is derek yeah, there's definitely a visceral difference. And no offense to any Derek's out there. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> but that's not my name. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, mm. And so that's how we tune the heart. That's how you recognize how your heart signals truth versus non-truth for you. Right? Mm -hmm. And then that can be your your navigator. So whenever you're trying to feel through something, should I do this or that? Feel it, right? Feel into those different scenarios and you will now know how your heart responds to a yes for you because my truth is going to be very different from your truth and vice versa, right? There isn't, mm -hmm. there is the truth, capital T, but there's multiple truths that lead us to that truth, right? And so when you know what, how, how your heart signals what is truthful for you in that moment and your truth will change and evolve, right? But just knowing that, that will be a really beautiful way to navigate through decision-making. Final question is, what is your favorite thing about yourself? Oh, <laughs> um... My indomitable faith, which definitely verges on crazy sometimes, <laughs> but just the constant fire in me that, that trusts and is curious and open and operates from that place of love. Wow. Why do you say your faith is, why do you call it crazy? Because in this dimension, most people would, would, would uh, assess it as that. As an entrepreneur, okay. you know, you, you, you tend to have just extra openness and curiosity and in a world that, you know, that 
isn't the the status quo, you tend to ruffle a lot of feathers. Beautiful. And I'm curious, like, what does that look like, the ruffling of feathers? Like, wh when was the last time you felt that you've ruffled feathers? What, what happened? Um, <laughs> I don't know. Yesterday? <laughs> I, I think, you know, a lot of people, their, their, their fundamental operating system is based on fear. And when you have liberated yourself from that matrix, from that contractive matrix, it's, it's scary and confusing to many people. So mm -hmm. it will, it will constantly, uh, trigger somebody that is still programmed in fear. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing. For anyone who wants to know more about you or connect with you or learn about your company, Standing Lights, or the second company that you're starting coming up, like where do they go? At Standing Light on Instagram mm -hmm. and standinglight.com has everything. Beautiful. Nayla, thank you for being Standing Light and for beautiful message and the tools that you give. Thank you for ruffling the feathers because the more of us that ruffle the feathers, the better. <laughs> and I'm not alone in doing that either. So uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. 